Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us in Cornerstone Young Professionals' continuing series on Psalm 23. My name is Mark, and I'm going to be guiding you through this study today on Psalm 23, verse 3. Now, for some of you who may have watched our channel before, our lessons before, you may notice that this is a little different than what you may have seen in the past and likely different than what you're going to see going forward. And that's really just a factor of us in a transition of changing the format of how we're going to deliver the lessons, which is really just due to the circumstances we have in the world today. But as a ministry, we felt it vitally important that we maintain continuity through this lesson series and deliver God's word to you the best way we can, because delivering God's word and being in God's word is really the most important thing we have. So with that, I'm going to start us in, in prayer. Father in heaven, you are our protector, our provider, and our shepherd. We don't know what's going on in the world today, but we know it's all part of your plan and that in the end you will be glorified. We thank you for this time that we can gather together in your name and just dwell in your presence. We ask that you guide our thoughts, our actions, our words during this troubled time so we ultimately can reflect your glory. We ask all this in your son's precious name. Amen. So what I'd like you guys to do now is take some time and watch the Psalm 23, verse 3 video on Right Now Media by Matt Chandler. There's a link below that will lead you to that video. If you don't have access to Right Now Media, that's perfectly okay. There's a link also below that will guide you to access for Right Now Media. There's also a link that will lead you to the lesson materials as well, as well, so you can print those out for your small group and have those for discussions. So I'll see you back here in a bit. Thanks for coming back. I hope you really enjoyed that video by Matt Chandler. I, I just love how he literally took 14, 15 words out of the Bible and just enlightened us so much with God's plan and design for us, his path for us. So I'm an engineer, and being an engineer, I tend to gravitate towards two things. I analyze and I apply. And I've actually found that this has helped in my spiritual growth because when I go into God's word, I tend to dissect it and want to really pull out the meaning, but also apply what that means in my life as it exists today. And I think that's where a lot of Christians uh, can stumble to some extent. We really like what the Bible says, but the application seems to be elusive uh, nebulous or vague, and it can be frustrating at times. So I'm hoping that through my lesson today, uh, you'll see how you can apply some of uh, what is in Psalm 23. But before I, before we go into uh, the the Bible, I'd like to ask you guys: How do you restore yourself? How have you sought restoration in the past? You know, when you're angry, when you're fearful, when you're in despair, uh, when you're empty, when you're lonely, how have you sought to restore yourself? And if you want to pause the video right now and discuss this among your sh small group, that'd be great. You know, some people may restore themselves through their worship. Uh, some people have tried to restore themselves through a, a relationship. Uh, you may restore yourself through your prayer. You may have tried to restore yourself through really what turned out to be an addiction. You may seek restoration in serving others. 
Uh, maybe you've tried to seek restoration in binge watching Netflix. Or maybe it's something worse than Netflix. But whatever you've written down, I want you to set that aside and we're going to come back to that later. Right now, we're going to delve into the first part of Psalm 23, verse 3. And I want to actually parse it out word by word. He restores my soul. So in John, I'm sorry, yes, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I think that's actually pretty clear. If we want restoration in our souls, in our life, we need to take that through Jesus. There's just no other way. And when we hear that word restores, you might think of words, think of images like an archaeological dig or a museum piece, something that's been broken or faded from its original design. And honestly, I think that describes us perfectly, right? Um, we are broken from God's original design through our sin. But restores is a present tense verb. It's an active action going on. And I know it's a detail, and that's where my engineering brain kicks in. But as an active present tense action, uh, it's telling me that God is with us in all this. It's going to be an ongoing. It's not like he has restored us, that this is something in the past, that it's a one-time thing. It's an active, ongoing action that's happening in the present. And in the present, God is with us, which, you know, I know this will be a big shocker, but it's true to his word because we can read in Deuteronomy 31.6 where God tells his people that he will not leave us, nor will he forsake us. And he's restoring me, which is a personal effort. You know, we've gone through several of uh, these verses already. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now he is restoring my soul. And in Luke 19.10, Jesus tells us, or says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The key word in there is seek. And in, Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still, again, key word there, still sinners, Christ died for us. So God is taking me just as I am, with all my sin, with all my hurt, with all my habits, with all my hangups. He's going to restore me just where I'm at. And he's going to restore you just where you are at. And, of course, he's restoring my soul. Now, I find it interesting, that word, because we can find in the Bible lots of Bible verses that say, love God with all your heart or your mind, all your strength or your soul. And actually, one of the earliest references to this I found is in Deuteronomy 6.5, which says exactly that. And as that predates David, I'm thinking that David actually knew that. He could have written any one of those items, yet God inspired him to write soul. And why is that? I think it's because while your mind and your body will fail you at some point in time, that's, that's just what's going to happen. They will fail you. It is your soul that will go on for eternity. Your soul is the most important thing you have. Jesus reaffirmed this in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 through 37. He says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So the most important thing about you is your soul. It cannot be replaced, and it really cannot be ignored. And while it may become hurt or broken, we need Jesus to restore it. 
So that sounds great, I know, and now you're asking, well, how? I mean, that's why I am, am doing this lesson, to, to give you some of the hows behind it. And I think we can get some clues from Matt Chandler's video. Matt Chandler said that verse 3 is kind of an anchor point between what comes before and after in Psalm 23. And if we look at verse 2 in Psalm 23, it talks about green pastures and still waters. And I really like the Passion Translation in this regard because in reference to the green pastures and still waters, it says, that's where he restores my soul. So it's going to be the green pastures. And if you think about this in spiritual terms, the green pastures are where we are spiritually comfortable, where we are spiritually fed. Those places are going to be your main church service, your small church, your small groups. Just whenever you are in fellowship with, uh, with fellow believers, as it's written in the New Testament, when two or three are gathered in his name, I am there. But there's also the quiet waters. And think of that as the places where you are separate, separating yourself from the chaos in the world so you can focus on your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. That would be like your devotional time, your prayer time, or your quiet time with God. So now I want to look back at the list we wrote and ask you guys these questions. How are you stacking up? What are you engaging in? And do those answers indicate that you are on the wrong path? And if you're trying to take a worldly solution to solve a spiritual problem, like restoring your souls, you're really on the wrong path. But another question to ask yourselves is, just really in reference to those uh, spiritual restorations, do you feel restored? And if the answer is no, that's okay. I'm here to tell you that that's okay. One of my favorite songs right now is We Are Messengers. It's okay not to be okay. It doesn't make you any less of a Christian because you don't feel restored after main service or worship or even your quiet time with God. I would say that's, that's more of a call to action, that you to take that as an indication that you need to change something in your life. You need to you know, add something to your spiritual growth or change your approach in your spiritual growth. It's just how we are going to grow. One of the things to note with shepherds and, and sheep is they don't stay in the same pastures. They have to move from pasture to pasture. If they are in the same pasture, they, they will eat until there's nothing else, and then they will starve. So moving from item to item... Uh, in your spiritual growth is how you are literally going to grow. So please take some time in your table discussions to talk about those two questions because I think it will really help you in uh, improving your spiritual growth. So now I want to move on to the second part of Psalm 23. He leads me on paths of righteousness for his namesake. In Jeremiah 31, 9, it says, Tears of joy will stream down their faces, and I will lead them home with great care. They will walk beside quiet streams and smooth paths where they will not stumble, for I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my oldest child. Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So when we ask Jesus to restore us, which he will do, and I might add yet again, we are naturally in a place of surrender. And in that place of surrender, we are ready for him to lead us on those righteous paths, those good paths, those straight paths. And why is it done in this way, in this order? Well, Matt Chandler mentioned this in the video. It's because that is how God gets the glory. We have to surrender to him first, and then he leads us on the righteous path. 
Some of you may be familiar with the story of Gideon in Judges, where he is commanded by God to reduce his army from 10,000 to 300. And in Judges 7, 2, it's because, so Israel will not boast of the victory. All the glory will go to God. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it talks about the grace of God being a free gift that we cannot earn through our own works, but by faith alone. Why? So that no man can boast. So we need to surrender to God before going on the righteous path. If we don't surrender to God before following his path, we are changing his righteous path to our unrighteous path. And at best, that's really going to result in just the white-knuckled Christianity that none of us really want. We want that intimate relationship with God where we have joy in his presence. So what does this path look like? And it's going to be unique to you. It's going to be unique to me. But I think there's some common milestones. And I've put those up on the screen. Uh, This is something that our senior pastor had uh, given us in a lesson not too long ago. You know, our stages of spiritual maturity, starting from a pre-believer all the way up to a wise Christian. And I think the spiritual and soul restoration practices are our guide during that, tra- that, that path. And each one of those stages is going to be its own little path. But the righteous path within there is going to be through restoring your soul each and every time. But why do we stray from that path? Why do we falter? And I think it comes down to three things. There's a trust issue that we can't see the straight path. There's a pride issue where we want to be in control and we want to take all the credit. And I think there's a relational issue where we may may be willing to be controlled by something in this world But as long as we can see it, we can name it, we can claim it, we almost think we have some kind of control back. And that's not how our relationship with God works. We have no control over God. God's in control. Our relationship with God is on a spiritual level. So I think that gap between a worldly relationship and a spiritual relationship also makes us falter on the straight path. So I think we need to have a perception change to try to see things the way God sees them. And I have an illustration for you. If I took this map and put it in front of somebody and asked them, hey, draw a straight line between these two points, they may draw something like this. And if I come back to them and say, no, here's the straight path, uh, that might start some interesting arguments and debates because they know what they know, what they see as a straight path, and then someone or some things telling them, no, this is actually the straight path, and it looks pretty crooked to them. But this is where we need to change our perception of the straight path to God's perception of the straight path. Last year has actually been really challenging for me medically. Uh, Last month, I actually had a tumor extracted from my skull. And what's interesting is that a year prior, I was actually in the same position. I was about two weeks out from surgery to have them extract this exact same tumor. You know, there was a misdiagnosis going on, and when, when it finally got diagnosed correctly, I was put on a medical therapy to try to... Uh, shrink the tumor and and get everything back into balance. Um, That ultimately didn't work. And so I had this surgery um, last month. You know, while I was in recovery, I actually really started to think, it's like, what did I gain? How do I not look at last year as completely wasted? I mean, it was emotionally draining. It was physically draining. Um... You know, there were bouts of depression going on. In fact, as I ended 2019 last year, um, it really felt like my body was being eaten from the inside out. And so 
I'm in recovery now. Tumor's gone. And I'm thinking, I could be so far ahead. I could be a year ahead, you know, right now in my, you know, my emotional and physical recovery, and I'm just not there. And how do I not look at it as a wasted time? Uh, and in that, God spoke to me and said, look at your life again. And so I did that. And I looked back at the very first series we did in 2019 as a young professionals group. It was called True Spirituality by Chip Ingram. And if you have a chance, please go through that. I believe you will be totally transformed by doing that. I would have missed our small church retreat and the friendships and bonding that happened there and the spiritual growth. I don't even know if I would have been in this ministry or any other ministry, uh, you know, serving them and using my gifts the way um, I've been able to, to, to do. Um, I have been would have missed a, a missions trip uh, where, again, there was spiritual growth that happened there and almost, almost a breaking of, uh, of sorts, which I was needed in my life at the time. So while my path physically, mentally, emotionally, was very crooked. It was actually a straight path to God. And I think what's helped me during that time is, even though I was going through quite a bit, I still maintain my presence in the community of believers. And I think that's one key in maintaining your straightness of your path, the path of righteousness. That, that God's leading you on is maintaining that community of believers. And I also think I was able to use my, my gifts to enhance God's kingdom the way I believe he's designed me to do. So one way I think we can surrender to God and, and have him put us on the right path is knowing our spiritual gifts. When you know your spiritual gifts, you're actually taking control of whatever's controlling you in, your, in this life, and you're surrendering that to God. That may be a person that's controlling you. That may be something, a substance that's controlling you. But knowing your spiritual gifts and acting on your spiritual gifts is taking control away from those things. And honestly, sometimes that thing might be you. But you're taking control of it, and you're giving it to God. So how do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Well, Cornerstone does offer classes on your spiritual gifts, determining what those are. There's also a Right Now Media series called Design, and you can use that to help you determine your spiritual gift. And I would encourage you to use those resources as a way to surrender to God and go on the righteous paths. So with that, I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again that we can come and dwell in your presence and learn more about you. The trials that we are in, the, 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 the hurt and the suffering that's going around, of course you know it all, and we just ask you, if you can, just take this cup from us. Ease our suffering, but as always, it is what your will is. In all this, if you can guide us to surrender to you, to, to be just for you, so that we can follow you on your path for us that glorifies you, the everlasting God. In this your name we pray, amen.